So if you have your Bible, we're in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. So that's the first half of Romans 13 this morning. We're just going to dive right in. So if you have a Bible, open up there, Romans 13. And we're going to be all over the Bible this morning, by the way. So if you have a Bible, it's great to have one open in front of you. If you don't have one, you can grab one from our next steps table out in the lobby as well. But with that, this is the Word of God. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, is the Word of God. Paul writes, Let every person... Be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval." For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed, is the word of God. So we've been uh, studying now the book of Romans for a long time. Uh, We're probably close to two years in the book of Romans. And, you know, Romans really does give us some subjects that are very weighty, doesn't it? Romans gives us these weighty subjects that can be extremely difficult to wrestle with. For example, the book of Romans makes no qualms about the wrath of God. The wrath of God, something that isn't posted in newspapers very often, is the subject of the wrath of God. Why? Because it's a very weighty subject. And it's the Bible's teaching that God is angry with sin... And that God, as a just judge, will punish sinners. That's a pretty weighty subject, isn't it? There's other weighty subjects, subjects like sin. The subject of sin, which is especially weighty because Paul seems to talk about sin almost at every turn throughout the book of Romans. Especially, you know, the fact that he kind of distinguishes even between types of sin. You remember back in Romans chapter 5, Paul talked about this idea of original sin. Something that we hardly ever talk about in our culture. Original sin is the teaching that as human beings, we are actually born guilty because of Adam's sin. We're actually born into this world guilty before God because of Adam's sin some thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And on top of that, original sin teaches that we have corrupt natures, that by nature we aren't good, but we're actually distorted and we're twisted and turned to actually love sin more than we love God. So it's pretty weighty. And then Paul even talks about the effect that sin has, the extent of sin, that sin actually touches every single faculty of our human existence. It affects our bodies, it affects our minds, it affects our desires, it affects every single part of us. And you go on in the book of Romans, and the the topics just get even weightier and weightier. Paul talks about this idea of predestination, or this idea of election, this idea that the Bible teaches that God sovereignly chooses our eternal destiny even before we were born, and he chooses those whom he's going to save by Jesus Christ. Those are weighty topics. And as weighty as those topics and subjects are, and have been to talk about, I would argue that none feels as weighty, at least on my end, none feels as weighty as the subject that Paul brings up today. And as you can guess from what we read about just now in Romans chapter 13, Paul is going to tell us this morning uh, how we as Christians are to relate to the government, how we are to relate to the governing authorities. So I feel the weight. And there's a reason I feel the weight. And the reason is because In our culture, we suffer from what, you know, political scientists and experts call polarization. 
right? Polarization, meaning that our political opinions, the political opinions of Republicans and Democrats are moving more and more away from each other. They're moving toward the outer poles of the political spectrum. And with this polarization comes less conversation with one another and less mutual understanding of one another. NPR, in fact, just ran this recent article. It was called uh, the, big the Big Sort, The Big Sort. And it was talking about this new phenomenon in American life where uh, Americans are beginning to move out of districts, out of voting districts where they are the minority to go be with people who are more politically like-minded with them. So what they're saying is that now in America, red districts are becoming more red, blue districts are becoming more blue, and the result is just a complete lack of understanding. And we now live in what they call echo chambers. Echo chambers where our opinions and our beliefs are merely repeated by the people around us and it results in a lack of conversation. And along with this polarization, right, also comes deep mistrust and suspicion. Real suspicion of people who don't agree with us politically. I looked up these statistics. In 1960, 4% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats say that they would be displeased if their child married someone of the opposing par party. That was in 1960, 4%. Now, in 2019, can you guess, did those numbers rise or fall? <laughs> in the year 2019, 35% of Republicans and 45% of Democrats say they would be displeased if their child married someone of the opposing party. And another interesting statistic, and this just illustrates mistrust and suspicion as well, 2020, 80% of Republicans and 80% of Democrats, that one's even, both believe that the members of the opposing party are a threat to democracy. That's right. <laughs> so we have deep polarization, don't we? Deep polarization, which has led to less conversation and mutual understanding, and that results in deep mistrust and suspicion of one another. But another reason that this feels so weighty is that I would say, hey, more than any time in American, in American history, we have actually allowed political affiliation to become a prominent part of our identity a prominent part of our identity. David Brooks, who's an op-ed writer for the New York Times, he made this observation that there's been this shift that's happened in American culture. And this happened, he said, around the year 1960. But he said, hey, pre-1960, the basic assumption was that we were essentially rotten people. We were essentially rotten people. And we all kind of agreed to that. We all looked inside of us and said, hey, there are things that need to improve. But he says, what happened is post-1960, the basic assumption changed, and we now view ourselves as morally pretty good people. And so what's happened as a result of that, instead of looking inside and saying, I need to change something about myself, we've taken on political identities that say, hey, if we want to fight evil in the world, we don't fight it inside of ourselves. We fight it with those people over there because we're basically good. And if we look inside ourselves and see a particular political affiliation, then we look at that other person and we say, well, they must be the bad people then, right? It only, it only uh, results in this idea that we battle one another with our ideologies. And now so deeply ingrained in us is our political identity that we don't know how to sort out right and wrong, good and evil. So it's for all those reasons that makes this section of Romans especially weighty and difficult. And Paul here in Romans uh, is really moving on from what he had started in Romans chapter 1 through 11. Remember, in Romans chapter 1 through 11, Paul was focused on the guilt of human sin, the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And in Romans chapter 12, he shifted to how we live in gratitude toward God. And over the past number of weeks... We've seen what this looks like, how to live lives of gratitude for the grace that God has shown guilty sinners like us. And Paul this morning, he says that one way that we express our gratitude, one way that we show gratitude for the God who has given us so much grace is how we relate to the governing authorities. So that's his question this morning. How should we as Christians, in gratitude, relate to the government? And what Paul does is he gives us a principle, gives us a principle that we can live by, when it comes to relating to the governing authorities, then he gives us a reason for that principle. And then 
he gives us a conclusion to follow from his principle and reason. So with that, Paul begins in verse 1, and it begins with the principle. When we relate to our governing authorities, this is what Paul has to say to us. He says very clearly, Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, he says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. That's Paul's basic principle. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. That is, as followers of Jesus, as those who want to follow Jesus in our life, every Christian is to first recognize the authority that the government has, and then, second, we are to submit to the government's leadership, and that's what it means to be subject to the governing authorities, to recognize and to submit. And now, I realize, even in verse 1, Okay, I realize even in verse 1, as soon as we read this principle, a handful of us already have a flood of questions and hypothetical situations and objections that fill our mind. And even just hearing the principle here laid out by Paul, we want to ask questions, don't we? We want to ask questions like, well, okay, but that can't be an absolute command, can it? Or questions like, well, are there any caveats? When can we not follow this principle? When can we disobey the governing authorities? And let me just say, those are good questions. Those are very good questions, and we'll get to that in turn. But in order to even get to that question, we have to understand this principle further. You have to go a little bit deeper. And here's why. Because if if you know Paul in particular, and you know early Christianity in general, you know that this principle of submission, that it really flowed out of a repeated pattern of how people as followers of Jesus, lived their life. This was a pattern of ceding power, handing over power, acknowledging those who were in power, and submitting to the authority of those in power. This pattern for Jesus' followers was nothing new. In fact, this pattern was commonplace for Christians. It wasn't just submitting to the government either. It was submitting to God in every single realm of life. So, for instance, this this had a huge bearing on how Christians thought of the marriage relationship, on how husband and wife were supposed to relate to one another. So Paul actually, in the book of Ephesians, said that this pattern of submission had a bearing on wives and husbands. There he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And he goes on to say, for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And this extended beyond marriage relationships as well. It extended into the workplace relationship. So Paul, in uh, his letter to another pastor named Titus, reminded bond servants, he says, bond servants, you're to be submissive to your masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. And then in church life, once you went out of the secular world and you walked into the churches, this same posture and pattern of submission was supposed to be followed. Uh, The author of Hebrews says to those in churches, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So can you see the pattern here? You guys following with the pattern? This pattern of being subject to authorities, of becoming a servant, also flowed out of, all these relationships flowed out of, merely the life of Jesus himself, who Jesus uh, became the form of a servant even though he was the king of the universe. So early early Christians, they actually had this song. When they wanted to praise Jesus for who he was, they sang this song. Many of us don't know that this is a song, but that's what most scholars think. It comes from Philippians chapter 2. They would sing this song. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So you see, this is just a repeated pattern throughout the New Testament. And this pattern, in fact, was 
as Christianity was expanding throughout the Roman world, this pattern and principle became even ingrained into the early life of the church. So much so that if you started out as, you know, kind of a servant of the church and you would maybe teach some Bible studies and as you made your way up the ranks into the church and you would become ultimately a pastor or a bishop, which oversaw many churches, they actually started having this term in order to give to bishops. And the term was this, when you were ordained as a bishop, you were called the servant of servants, right? And the idea behind that was that no matter how high you would rise in the church system, no matter how high you would rise, you would never see yourself as one who was above submission, above subjection, and one who wanted to serve in servant obedience. Because, friends, that was just the pattern of Jesus himself, who was willing to be subject to the governing authorities, even if it meant death, even if it meant death on a cross. So you see, this principle and pattern of submission right? It was just ingrained in the New Testament, ingrained in the early church. And if we realize kind of our political climate, right, we also realize that this is, doesn't necessarily come natural to us, does it? This isn't our pattern that we typically follow, especially in our political climate marked by deep polarization. In fact, the pattern we follow, if our last two presidential cycles have been anything of an indicator, our pattern seems to be miles apart from submission, subjection, and servant obedience to one that's probably turned more to combativeness, defiance, and resistance. Let me just cite two examples, and I'm gonna punch right and I'm gonna punch left here, okay? Just to be fair, all right? I wanna be an equal opportunity offender here. <laughs> but here are two letters, two letters and two speeches that people made after the 2008 election and then after the 2016 election. 2008. An open letter to a pastor read, there is nothing, all caps by the way, you can't see that, there is nothing about this president that I can respect. In my opinion, he is a master of deception. I will not pray against him, but I cannot yet pray for him. I cannot support his socialism, pro-abortion, class envy, policies, and then he's writing to a pastor here. He says, Pastor, you are more gracious than I can ever be toward Barack Obama. So that's the punch left. Punch right. Donald Trump's hate does not have a mandate anywhere, especially not in our state. Donald Trump has attacked every value Coloradans embody. We want to fight the entirety of his administration. Let's stand up and show this administration that Denver will not continue to, to denounce the, or that Denver will continue to denounce these vile policies. This is not our president. So you realize, right, on both sides, our posture is very far in our political climate from submission and servant obedience, and it's become one of combativeness, defiance, and resistance. And that's why, hey, especially in our climate, we need, we need this principle that Paul lays down. Verse one, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And now again, I realize even Maybe you've seen this pattern and you've grasped this principle, but we still have questions. Questions like, well, what if the governing authorities are bad? What if the governing authorities are corrupt or can't be trusted? Do we have to submit to those governing authorities? Or similar thoughts surface. We think, well, Paul never could have imagined or anticipated what we're experiencing now. We're witnessing the decline of Western culture the decline of public trust, a lack of leadership and strong moral character. We're bombarded by news stories of our political leaders enmeshed in sexual scandals and bribery and coercion. Surely followers of Jesus aren't expected to submit to those governing authorities, are they? Well, it's interesting. If you know when Paul was writing this letter, the year was probably around the year 57. And the emperor of the Roman Empire was the emperor Nero. And now, if you know the personal character of Nero you know that it is not exactly admirable, okay? Nero was infamous for his sexual depravity. Infamous for his sexual depravity. He married his own stepsister. Her name was Claudia Octavia. And then when he was married to his own stepsister, he had an affair. He had an affair with a woman he found deeply attractive. Her name was Papaea Sabina. 
And his mother, Herod Agrippa, or, or, sorry, Ag Agrippa the Younger, she discovered the affair. And so in confronting Nero about it, Nero had his mother killed. And then, after getting into a squabble with Pape Sabina over the same issue, he kicked Pape Sabina in the stomach so hard that his pregnant wife had a miscarriage and then Pape Sabina died weeks after. And then after his death, Nero decided, I want to remarry. So what did he do? He found a, a boy on the side of the street who looked just like Pape Sabina. He had him castrated and then married him. And for the rest of Nero's life, Sporius was his name. Sporius was his wife throughout the rest of his life. So talk about sexual scandal, right? Talk about sexual, sexual scandal. And, in, and on top of his sexual depravity, by the way, was also this fact that Nero was cunning and murderous. We already talked about it, right? He killed his mother. He ended up killing his wife. He killed his stepbrother. We know that he killed the philosopher Seneca for disobeying him. Oh, and he killed countless Christians as well. In fact, this will highlight just how deep-seated the corruption of Nero's political leadership was. Shortly after Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, Nero wanted to build a palace. And so he had this idea. He needed to clear a lot of land for the palace. So he lit his own city of Rome on fire. And it wiped out a third of the city of Rome. Did it overnight. And then, shortly after, he went and blamed the fire on Christians, arrested the Christians who were responsible for the fire, and then he had them serve as human torches in his courtyard by lighting them on fire as kind of a twisted sort of uh, punishment for lighting the fire on Rome. Now, you may not like the current president of the United States, <laughs> and you may not have liked his predecessor, and you might not think much of our president's personal character or his moral fabric. You may not agree with his policies or approve the direction he's leading our country. You may think that he's the worst thing to happen to the United States since the 1995 MLB strike, but, <laughs> which is gonna happen this year again. But I think we can all agree that when we compare the sins and the shortcomings of Nero to the sins and the shortcomings of any US president, I think we can all agree that they pale in comparison to those shortcomings of Nero. I think we can all agree to that. So it's not as if Paul was unfamiliar with amoral, corrupt, coercive, or scandalous governing, governing authorities. No, he was all too familiar. Nonetheless, Paul says, even with leaders that lack any moral fabric, this principle of subjection to the governing authority still applies. And Christians, Christians, as followers of Jesus, Above all other citizens, we should be marked by this constant, unrelenting pattern of submissiveness, submission, subjection, and servant obedience to governing authorities and every other realm of life. We should be known as servants of servants. Servants of servants. That should be our mantra. The people who are most willing, ready, and eager to cede our power and serve and submit to others, just like our Lord Jesus. And now I know, again, some of you are saying, okay, I get the principle, I get the pattern, but when can we disobey? And again, we're going to get to that, okay? We're going to get to that. But again, we have to touch on a question, we have to go a little bit deeper. Because if you look at the second half of verse 1, go ahead and look at the second half of verse 1. Paul tells us, hey, behind this principle is a reason. He actually tells us why we're supposed to submit to the governing authorities. Verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For, because there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Paul says that's the reason we're to be submissive. Because every authority, every governing authority has been instituted by God. There's not one person who rules that does not have their authority from Jesus Christ himself. Meaning every governor that's ever been, every president that ever will be, every school board member that is elected, and every police chief that serves, every authority comes from God. God is sovereign. And he has instituted every single governing authority in our lives. So we can say without question, without question, in the United States, that though an official is elected by democratic vote or by an appointment to a position, we can say that in the final analysis, every authority is established by God. R.C. Sproul, who's an author, pastor, 
He wrote, God cast the final and decisive ballot in every single U.S. election. Every governing authority is instituted by God. And note, right, note this. What Paul has in mind here when he's thinking about this is he's thinking about Jesus, whom he knows has supreme authority over all the universe. He rules over every single thing as sovereign. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that the Bible is just saturated, dripping with this truth about who Jesus is and his authority, right? Jesus, when he was resurrected from the dead, he visited his disciples and he reminded them of this foundational truth. Jesus came to them, his disciples, and said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is saying, every authority comes from me. Every ruler comes from me. I have authority over them all. Paul, in another place, hammers home this point as well. Paul says in the book of Colossians, he tells us about who Jesus is, and he says, For by him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus has authority over everything. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul kind of puts the exclamation point on this. Paul tells us there that Jesus Christ will come again and he'll display at the proper time he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, who no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And any king that exists is just simply a lesser authority to Jesus himself. That's who Jesus is, the king of kings. Paul has that in mind here. And you can kind of understand this illustration, right? So Jesus is the king of kings, but all other authorities are subservient to him. I think of when I used to be a youth pastor in Nashville, there was always one kid. His name was Samuel Lane. And if we were going on, you know, a youth retreat or whatever it was, when I needed to step away for a while, I said, everybody, Samuel's in charge, right? Samuel was a freshman, but he was, you know, seven. So I told everybody, hey, with Samuel... When I'm gone, Samuel is in charge. My authority has been vested in him. And he what Paul is saying about all the governing authorities that we have in our world, we're subject to them in acknowledgement that Jesus, the King of Kings, has instituted them all and he's their Lord of Lords. And it's important that following up this statement, Paul kind of adds to it. He says these governing authorities specifically and the government as a whole God actually instituted them for a purpose. Did you catch that? In verse 3, he tells us what the purpose of governing authorities is, what the purpose of government should be. And he says, verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the evildoer. So you can see what Paul is saying here. He's saying, hey, governing authority, that governing authority that Jesus has established in the governments of this world, they have been instituted by God to administer justice. That's their purpose. They exist to administer justice. Paul describes them bearing a sword, right? Which means they have the right as leaders to punish evil conduct, punish bad conduct, and strike down those who do wrong. To actually use force to stop evil from spreading in the world. That's the purpose of government. To encourage good conduct, support what is right, punish evil, to bring justice and bear the sword. That's the purpose of government. And you see that purpose, by the way, even in the earliest parts of the Bible. So remember in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, we see that God has created a world, Adam and Eve are in that world, and there's perfect order. 
perfect harmony, perfect relationships. But when Adam and Eve don't remain in subjection to God himself, who's their only and highest authority, when they don't do that, then all that comes from there is this flood of injustice and this flood of rage that ensues. So you know in the story, Genesis chapter 4, right, Cain and Abel, Cain, being jealous of his brother, strikes down his brother Abel in cold blood. And then you see from there, after that first murder and that first injustice comes, this flood continues to take place. We're told of this man, his name is Lamech. And Lamech is simply struck by a young man. He's struck by a young man. And we read that Lamech says to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. Right? A punch deserves a knife in the back. You see the injustice in that, don't you? And so God's response in this world that is spiraling into chaos and injustice and vigilante retribution, God's response is he sends a cataclysmic flood and saves one family. One family on the earth, the family of Noah. And as Noah's family is coming out of the ark after God has completely destroyed all flesh on the earth, God has this final word. He says, for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. See, God establishes a system of a sword, of a sword, which simultaneously restrains sin and punishes evil when it occurs. It's a system that administers justice. That's the role of government. And when you think in those terms, right, government is a tremendous blessing because if God did not establish this, we would utter, uh, descend into utter chaos. Has anybody ever been to a YMCA daycare? Talk about a place that has no governing authority whatsoever, right? There's a teenager looking over three and four-year-olds, and there are no consequences for actions. And we used to drop our kids off at the Nashville uh, YMCA daycare, and you want a snapshot of anarchy on earth, that is it. Pacifiers being stolen, diapers being thrown, three-year-olds crying in the corner, and it smells awful in there. Not a diaper's being changed. Mere anarchy, right? Anarchy on earth. So we can thank God for this tremendous blessing of a system that God has established of people who bear the sword to administer justice and restrain what would otherwise mean our destruction of ourselves because of sin. So here, now that Paul has answered how we're to relate to governing authorities, right, he's given us the principle, submit to the governing authorities. And he says that's based on the pattern of submission and servant obedience throughout the New Testament, And we do this for a reason, because God himself has established the governing authorities to administer justice on evildoers. Now it's appropriate to ask, now that we've covered that, well, when can we disobey? When does this principle not apply? And I do want to just ask you this question. Why is it that when we hear this principle by Paul, our first question that pops into our mind is, yeah, but when can I disobey? Doesn't that speak something of our hearts a little bit? I want you to think of a mother and a child. And a mother says, hey, Susie, I love you. I care for you. I I want what's best for you. And for that reason, I never want you to touch the stove. And Susie, we would know something's wrong with that relationship between her mom and something's wrong with Susie's heart if all of a sudden she said, yeah, but when can I touch it, mom? When can I touch that stove? When is it okay for me to touch the stove? If that's her first inclination, if that's her first thought pattern, what does that say about her heart? And so that's just a question for us, and and we're going to get to the question, by the way, but that's just a question for us. Why is it when we hear submit to the governing authorities, our first thought is, but when can we disobey? That speaks something to our heart, doesn't it? But here's the answer to the question. The obvious answer is yes, of course. Of course, a time comes when we can disobey the government. And again, we see a pattern in the Bible when disobedience is called for. The book of Exodus. Great first example you see of this in the Bible. Pharaoh, who's the king of Egypt, right? The Pharaoh, the ruler of all of Egypt, 
He's afraid that his slaves, who are the Israelite people, that they're going to rise up in rebellion against him. So he orders midwives who are delivering babies. He says, if anyone comes out of a male, you're to kill them on the spot. And so the midwives, being godly women, say, we can't obey. We can't kill children at your command. We just can't do it. When your authority supersedes the authority that God has set down, we, we can't obey. Fast forward about 700 years later, there's another example. There's Daniel. Daniel and his friends are in exile in Babylon. And there's a king. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is, for all intents and purposes, a pretty shady king. But Daniel serves him faithfully. His friends serve him faithfully. But one day comes when Nebuchadnezzar erects this massive statue of, him, of himself and says, everyone on earth, when you hear the song of the statue, you have to bow down and worship the idol. And Daniel and his friends say these words. They say, hey, king, be it known to you, O king, that we'll not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. We, we just won't do it. Move ahead to the year 30 AD. And Peter and John, they've just been told by Jesus, go out and make disciples. I have all authority in heaven and earth. This is your mission. Go tell people the good news of who I am. And the Jewish council arrest Peter and John. And they say, you can no longer teach in his name. The name of Jesus, it should not be uttered on your lips. And what's their response? They say, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we've heard and what we've seen. So you see that underlying pattern, right, of civil disobedience. It's very simple. In the case of the midwives and Daniel, they were asked by the government to do something that God had said, no, that's forbidden. And for that reason, they say, we're not going to murder. We are not going to worship false gods. Therefore, we will not do it. When asked to do what God forbids, they disobeyed. Their commitment to their governing authorities ended at that point. In the case of Peter and John, it's similar, but in the case of Peter and John, they were asked by their governing authorities to not do something that God commanded, what he told them to do. And their commitment to their governing authorities at that point became null and void. So you see, in all three instances, the pattern is clear. When the governing authorities tell us to sin by either doing something God has forbidden or not doing something that God has commanded, we disobey. We disobey. Knowing that though these authorities are instituted by God, they have no authority to ask their subjects to sin. Ruling authorities cannot simultaneously say, listen to me and disobey God. They can't do that. And by the way, recognizing this pattern, by the way, you also see kind of this current going through all these instances of disobedience. In each instance of disobedience, the clear motive and purpose behind it is to honor and worship and glorify God alone. That's it. That is their motive. That's their purpose. That's what they say. No, I will not do this any further. That's the line that they draw. So another thing for us to consider, by the way, is, hey, when it comes to our impulse towards civil disobedience, is that our motive? Is our motive to honor, glorify, exalt the goodness of our God over everything else, or is it something else? What is driving that impulse for, toward our civil disobedience? And hear me clearly here, because as followers of Jesus, while it's wonderful, and by the way, I, I, don't say, I say this with all sincerity on my lips, while it's wonderful to live in a place that affords us certain freedoms and rights and privileges and liberties, while it's great to live in a country where I can actually stand up on Sunday morning and I'm not under threat of being arrested, while those things are great, they are never guaranteed in the Bible, and they are never the basis for civil disobedience in the Bible. It's always for the glory and the honor and the majesty of God, and that's the driving motive and purpose behind it. So we should thank God for our civil freedoms, but we should never use them or cling to them Above honoring God is our first primary motive and principle. That's just a basic fact of the Bible. But it is a sincere question, right? Well, what, what about our rights? What about when our rights are being infringed upon? And this is where we just need to be careful, as followers of Jesus, just careful to distinguish between those rights which are afforded to us in the Bible and those rights which are afforded to us under the United States Constitution. Because 
we can run a danger of unintentionally making the Constitution the 67th book of the Bible. The Constitution is wonderful. It is great. It is, in my opinion, the greatest system of government that has ever been created. I sincerely say that. But we have this danger, which Charles Colson brought out. He said, we have a danger of wrapping Christianity and the cross in our national flag. And we need to be careful not to do that. So we need to make this distinction. There is rights afforded to us by the Bible, and there are rights afforded to us under the Constitution that are not always the same. Let me give you an example of this. The First Amendment, the right to a freedom of speech, right? The Bible tells us, actually, we don't even necessarily have a freedom of speech. In the Bible, we have the right and the freedom to speak the truth always in love. That's the only right a Christian has to speak the truth in love at all times. So while under the First Amendment to the Constitution, we have the right to go on Twitter and say whatever we want, how we want it, in the way that we want it, as Christians under the Bible, we don't have that right. We only have the right to say what is true in love all the time, charitably, even to that politician we don't like. So back to our question. How do Christians relate to the government? Paul says, hey, here's the principle, submit to the governing authorities. He tells us the reason for this principle, because God has instituted the authorities to administer justice. And finally, he gives us a conclusion. Actually, he gives us two conclusions. The first is in verse 2. Paul says this first conclusion is, when we disobey the government, when disobedience is unwarranted and unlawful, it's to disobey God himself. So he says, verse 2, therefore, good conclusion word, therefore, whoever resists the authorities... Resist what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. And really, Paul here is just practically applying what he said earlier, showing us how interconnected God as the King of Kings and our governing authorities really are. Remember earlier, Paul had said, Jesus is the King of Kings. All other authorities are under his authority. Therefore, we're to submit to their rule. And Paul is simply reversing this interconnected order here. He's saying, hey, when we disobey... Not only are we disobeying our governing authorities, but we're disobeying the king of kings himself. We're disobeying God. And we see, right, even in our own lives, how interconnected these things are. That when we disobey God, right, it's kind of like dominoes. You knock over that first block and then a flood of disobedience results from it, doesn't it? So that when you disobey God, all of a sudden you're prone to disobey teachers and police officers and civil servants and the DMV. Actually, By the way, if there's a carve-out in this, I think it's the DMV. Uh, You might be able to disobey them. I'll I'll consult with God later and let you know. I'll let you know next week. No, but what Paul's showing is how interconnected these things are, aren't they? And likewise, when you go from the other end of the domino chain, the same thing happens, right? If we're people who already by default want to disobey our city workers and tax collectors, again, Maybe a caveat there. Tax collectors or other government personnel, how can we expect to obey the one from whom all authority flows? How can we expect to obey Jesus? If you find paying the IRS 10 to 35% of your income very difficult and are tempted to disobey, how hard is it going to be to obey Jesus who says, give me everything that you have? It's going to be pretty difficult, right? But Paul just shows us how interconnected these things are. And he says, here's the conclusion. When you disobey the governing authorities, you disobey God himself. And then Paul gives a final conclusion in verse 5. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, right? That's the idea of to avoid justice, right? Why don't I speed? Well, a lot of times it's because I just don't want to get a ticket. So to avoid God's wrath, that's one reason to, to be in subjection to God and to our governing authorities. But he says, also for the sake of conscience. That is to say, when we submit to the governing authorities, we do so to avoid God's wrath, but we also want to do what's right according to conscience. And we know, we know that in order to do what is right according to conscience, we simply follow the pattern of Jesus Christ himself. And you remember the pattern of Jesus. Remember the pattern of Jesus of Jesus, who though he was the king of kings, became for us the servant of servants. Right? Think, of, think of Jesus. He became a servant to his own father, who sent his son to go and live in perfect obedience to the law that he established, to go and be punished, to stand under his own father's wrath, 
In order to save sinners like us, he became submissive and subject to the ultimate authority of God, the Father himself. And he became a servant by even submitting to Pilate. Pilate, the the Roman governor in his area, and he, he just stood silent before this Roman governor who he himself instituted. And then he became a servant by submitting to Roman soldiers, right? Actually becoming a servant of servant to Roman soldiers who had authority only because Jesus himself gave it to him. And he became a servant by submitting even to the religious leaders of his days who had sinned against him. If anybody could go to the religious authorities and and say, hey, you know the law of God, you know God's word, and you know you're in the wrong. Nonetheless, he submitted and was spit on, punched, shamed, mocked, accused. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except for Jesus himself, who is the king of kings, who emptied himself, taking the form of servant of servants, and submitted himself to death, even death on a cross. Oh, and by the way, it was for us. It's for us. Just as I close here, I I was thinking about this conversation I had, you know, uh, early on when I became a pastor, I just had this kind of difficult time with... uh, with the church that I was working at, it wasn't anything huge, but I had a real hard time, like this, this real wrestling of whether or not I was going to submit to some of the leaders that were in this church that I was at. And I sat down with one of my good friends, his name was Drew, and Drew reminded me of, hey, I know you don't want to submit, and I know you think that what is going on might even be wrong. But he said this to me, he said, the way up in this life is the way down. If you want to succeed in this life according to the eyes of Jesus, who's the King of Kings, then look at what Jesus himself did, who was exalted by taking the form of servant, ser- by taking the form of a servant and being nailed to a Roman cross. And submitted himself to death to become the servant of servants, to go down even to the depths of the cross, to demonstrate for us that in submission, we actually go up. Because in this life, the way up is the way down. Friends, I can't think of a better way to live in gratitude to the God who is the King of kings and became the servant of servants. Let's live that way. In gratitude to God the Father for showing grace on guilty sinners like us. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, this is a weighty subject. And God, only you are the one that's able to work these things into us. You're the only one who's able to actually bring this transformation in our heart by your Holy Spirit, by virtue of the death of your son, Jesus Christ. You're the only one who can actually bring this sort of servant posture and pattern into our lives. And God, we pray that you would fix our eyes upon Jesus, who became the servant who bore our transgressions, who was acquainted with grief, who was crucified who was marred beyond human resemblance, who was crushed under the wrath of God because you, Heavenly Father, the supreme authority, said that it was your will to crush him. And it was your will to send your son, Jesus Christ, to submit even to Pilate, even to a Roman soldier, even to Roman authorities. And we need your grace to do likewise, God. It's just, it's impossible apart from you. So would you make us people who are more like this, who more reflect this, who pray for who are obedient to, who are charitable toward those who are in governing authorities and in positions of authority over us. God, would you do that in us? And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen.